passports are not crowned over months or years or days or weeks. It's 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 play these events and whoever can win those events is the best. That's that's the boiled down what we do. Once you go to the season long stuff, that's a separate topic. It's the tour champion. And tennis has that and golf has that. And that's also a massive title to have, but it's totally separate because it's earned over time. But you ultimately, even in tennis, you play all year long, you go to the tour championship, it's only eight people. Those people play in round robin, they play against each other. Eventually, there is a championship match. And whoever wins that is the tour champion. They're not anything else. They're the tour champion. So... I don't I mean, know. I think I'm very, I would I would love to have hear Ricky's talk, like more in depth thoughts about it. But well, we can do that kind of thought. because in our green room right now, oh okay, we have green room one, and, and and Nate, I'll get you I'll get you in this call here in just a second. But we have one Ricky Wysocki. Ricky, welcome to the show. Welcome back to the show. What up, Rick? Yeah, Ricky. Hey, what's up, guys? Can you hear me? Hey, how you doing? Yeah, you uh, sound before great. Before we go, any. Good. Any farther, I want to quickly make a, a full clarification. Last night, I reached out to Ari. I figured I'd go right to her about you joining tonight. She replied. I just reread it. She replied saying, uh, we're going to the Woo Sox game. I I very much interpreted that <laughs> as, as her Sox. putting her own spin on her going to the Red Sox game. And now that I see Ella Hansen and a few others posting about being at the Woo Sox game, a triple-A affiliate of the Red Sox, I now stand fully corrected, which is why you weren't in Cincinnati, which is why you weren't at uh, down at the Green Monster. So I take full blame it, for all of the, the, mis, the miscommunication <laughs> out there. But Ricky Wysocki <laughs> in the house, our Green Mountain champion. champion. How you doing, buddy? Doing good. Yeah, I'm just spending some time. We went to, like you said, the Woo Sox game. I think there was like a, it was like a pro tour day over there. So we had a lot of the pro tour guys over out there. Like you said, Matty O and Ella both threw out the first pitch. So that was pretty cool. What? And, uh, nice. Yep. So they both did. Yeah, it was really, it was really neat. So we had a bunch of disc golfers hanging out. They had a, they were, it was like disc golf day at the ballpark kind of deal. So it was fun. Uh, and um, so that's triple A, right? Is that what yep. I saw? Yeah, it's like a Silver Series for baseball. <laughs> okay, that's a good way, <laughs> that's a good way to put it. Uh, so, so is that still entertaining for you? I mean, you don't go to Silver Series events. You don't got time for that. <laughs> no, it was it was fun. Yeah, I mean, I can't say that I watched a lot of baseball. It was more like hanging out and, you know, oh, another disc golfer walked by and talked to them for a little bit, and then you go, you know, and then another <laughs> disc golfer walks by five minutes later. So it's more of just kind of socializing, hanging out, and watch a pitch here and there. So I, don't, I couldn't even tell you the score when I left. <laughs> so it was more just to well, socialize and hang out. Well, that's perfect. Now, speaking of watching or seeing anything, all I've been seeing for the last two days, or not seeing, is Maple Hill and the fog on the course. What is that like? What What is going on out there? Is it, and is it supposed to continue to be foggy? Because every single post on Instagram and on social media is just fog. Like where you can't yes. see down the fairway yes. 300 feet. Yeah, so that was on Monday after the event. And I think that it was, yeah, it was crazy. People were throwing like whole one over the water and you didn't know at all where it, it could be in a Christmas tree. It could be in the water. You don't have any idea. Um, and yeah, so that was that was crazy. I was actually in downtown Boston. So it was cool. All the, all the skyscrapers were like cut off from the fog, like halfway up the building. So I think it was, I don't think it's going to be like that the rest of the week because today I practiced and it wasn't like that, but. Uh, yeah, pretty unique conditions. I've never seen anything like that at Maple Hill. And so just to clarify, uh, it's about three and a half, maybe four hours, depending on uh, on how fast you're rolling, to get from the Green Mountain Resort or the Smuggler's Notch Resort in Green Mountain uh, area to, down to Maple Hill, right? Three and a half, four hours? Mm-hmm. Yep. And so it did did I see everyone roll out on – on Monday morning, were there were there any uh, fun zone activities Sunday night? What was going on? Yeah, so so I definitely I stayed in town, had some had a good breakfast on Monday, and I had my victory uh, victory uh, meal. It was it was actually really funny. I went to like one of the local shops in Vermont, and they had creamies, which is like soft serve ice cream mixed with maple syrup. <laughs> and it's a total Vermont mm-hmm. thing; you can only get that in Vermont. 
So I was telling Ari and my whole crew that I was with all week, I'm like, all right, if I win the tournament, we're all going to go out and get maple creamies. Because obviously I try to eat healthy and, and eat clean as much as I can, but I was going to splurge. And, uh, and so we went. It was like breakfast. Like We went that night and everything was closed after the tournament. So I was like all bummed out. And then I went for breakfast the next morning. We woke up and it was like 9.30 or something. Went to a local shop. And this lady like, I'm like, oh, I was all pumped to get a creamy. And she's like, it was like 9.30 in the morning. And, uh, and she's like, oh, yeah, it's breakfast of champions. And she had no idea who I was or what, like, the disc golf tournament was going on. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is really fitting. I have breakfast of champions, no doubt. How would you know? <laughs> it was so random. Uh, and so, yeah, the, uh, Creamies was the breakfast of champions on Monday. Yeah, I feel weird asking if you got your creamies, but it sounds like you did. <laughs> so, <laughs> yep, I did. <laughs> good to hear. Yeah, it was great. Uh, it's, <laughs> So as you can see, very special. We got Nate Doss, uh, who put an end to that little streak you previously had out at GMC. Uh, Nate Doss is in the house tonight, and we've got Johnny V. But uh, I, w we're going to lead right into it. We kind of talked about it already. How how much conversation have you had about the umbrella? Umbrella and, gate. And are you in fact? Yeah, are you in fact sick of talking about it? And, and so give us well, give us your take, yeah. and then maybe we can move on. No, no, I'm glad you. I'm glad you brought it up. So, I think the two things that I've basically got feedback from was the obviously the umbrella, and then the emotion. Some people were giving me like, I guess I don't know, bad feedback or something. I don't, I don't really know how to take it, but they were just, I guess talking talking bad about me, like letting out emotion. So I guess I'll shed some light on both of those. So the first, the okay. first uh, thing is the umbrella. When I threw the shot on what was that hole fourteen. Uh, 14, yep. when I hit the umbrella, when I threw the shot, I actually thought that I hit like the OB stake. I didn't know what it was. I just knew it was really close to the stake. And, um, and so I heard something when I threw it and I was like, all right, whatever. And then I walked up there and the spectator was like, oh, yeah, you hit the umbrella or something. And, uh, and I was like, okay, that's kind of weird. Like I didn't know where the umbrella was or anything. And I looked back at the video. I was like, oh, wow. Like, you know, I watched it a couple times. I was like thinking like, oh, you know, trying to determine if I was going to go OB or not. It was like, I think it was like a 50-50 shot, like if I would have went OB or not. Um, but, uh, but I mean, at the end of the day, the hole would have played out way different. You know, if I went OB, I probably may would maybe would have just got a four, a bogey instead of a five after everything that happened on that hole. So the hole could have very likely played out completely different if I did go out of bounds and didn't hit an umbrella, you know. So... You, yeah, and, it, it definitely and maybe, was a crazy moment in the tournament. Yeah, and let me interject to that. Let, let's just play pretend. You hit the umbrella. You stay out of bounds. You don't make the putt, even though you'd made every other putt from OB. But let's just say you don't make the putt. Maybe your four, which is still a bogey, maybe it just doesn't affect you the same way the wildness of the five that did, right? Is I mean, clearly it's all you, we'll never know, but... It would yeah. still be a bogey, but it might have sat better than the double that you did take, maybe? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it would have been a whole different mindset. I mean, it was funny. I, I think I seen someone say, disc, don't lie, <laughs> or something like this. <laughs> the, you know, this wanted to go be on the drive, and then it ended up going out of bounds <laughs> on the putt. Uh, so, disc, don't lie. <laughs> so, probably, yeah. Disc didn't lie on that hole, that's for sure. I mean, sometimes it does, but not on that, that, that day it didn't. <laughs> Well, didn't want to lie down, that's for sure. So, yeah, uh, no. There's nothing you can do as you walk up. As you said, you, you pretty much ignored it. Doss, you called it. You know, when you walked up, clearly somebody said, we couldn't hear it exactly, but somebody had said, oh, you know, you, you probably had said you hit, you know, the umbrella, and you're like, okay, whatever. I mean, you couldn't tell from way back there. Did you feel as if, even though you knew you, you thought you hit the stake, did you feel like it wasn't that great of a shot in the first place? Did that, is that what it felt yeah. to you? Yeah, I mean, so I'm trying to throw that right gap. So a lot of people try to throw the inside uh, gap on the left. And uh, it's a little obviously more risky throwing the right gap that I'm throwing. But I like it because there's um, if you throw the correct shot, there's really there's a nice landing zone to the right side of the basket about 20, 30 feet right where there's no trees. You basically just throw a nice flex shot nice and straight. Like I did the first round, I threw it to like 20 feet. And so I just like the play. I think it's for me it's uh, it fits my natural – I have a natural flex – flex shot is my natural you know natural shot shape and so it just fits that my eye really a lot better than the up the middle shot and i did pull it a little bit to the right uh to where it was going close to the out of bounds line and so yeah that's that's the risk you take when you start going towards out of bounds line when you got galleries and people and umbrellas i mean <laughs> i could have hit the umbrella and also bounced out of bounds too you know it could have you know could have went 
both ways. And, um, and so, yeah, it's, 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 it was, it was crazy. I didn't, and I didn't obviously know, you know, how I hit it or, you know, if it kept me in or out, I just knew I hit an umbrella. I didn't know if it helped me or hurt me or anything. So it wasn't like I was going into it feeling guilty. Like I got away with one or something, you know, I just went up there and couldn't see it because I was, you know, blind, you know, from the tee pad. And so I think that helped my mindset not be like, oh, I just got super lucky. Like I better capitalize on it and put too much pressure on myself or, or something like that. You know, just so my mindset was pretty like pretty good, uh, you know, as opposed to like this, the gallery that could actually see what happened. Now, you you had a veteran move, which I can really appreciate and I think is understated for a lot of players out there that maybe either are newer or just simply don't think about it with the emotions and the moment in that you knew when you went out of bounds on the putt that you could just take it from where you were. And I think a lot of people, you could be playing 20 years and still forget that that's an option. Hmm. Did you hesitate? Did you immediately know, oh, I'm just going to throw from here again? Did you think about it for one second? What what was going through your mind? And did you even consider going back down the hill? Or was that twice as far? You know, I guess just set up once it went out of bounds. What's everything that went through your mind? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a tough spot. I mean, it's because, you know, as your disc is rolling out of bounds, you want to, like, you want to rage and you want to get pissed. And so I kind of, like, I wasn't, like, happy about it, but I, like, definitely, like, didn't get as mad as I, you know, looking back as I definitely could have. I think that's what actually helped me, you know, not get too, you know, upset and really let it affect me and for the rest of the round. And uh, and so I think that that was super important. And and so as as soon as I saw my disc rolling towards the out of bounds, I that thought popped in my head like, oh, this goes OB, like I can just re putt. And you know, it's not, you know, it wasn't that tough of a putt, but once you do what I did and roll out of bounds, like that putt becomes a lot harder. Because <laughs> you're putting for five, and you're you know still 20 feet away. You just missed it. Watched it roll out of bounds, and all the craziness that already happened on the hole. So it just there was everything was fighting against you, and so that putt just becomes that much harder. It feels like double the distance almost because of the mental battle you're fighting with yourself. Um, there's so many you know so many things going on in your head. So you just got to focus on focus on the mechanics. Focus on what you know what I do all the time at the practice basket. And so um, it's so much easier said than done. But yeah, it's you know I. I felt like I, you know, I calmed the nerves as much as I possibly could and got the bad thoughts out of my head. And yeah, like I said, I, you know, as it was rolling, I kind of saw it going towards out of bounds. So that pop, that, that, uh, thought of like, Hey, I should just re putt from here. Cause it's way closer. And I'm putting for, for the same uh, amount of strokes on the hole as I would if I went, you know, way down the hill to where I went out of bounds. I'm basically saving like 20 feet. Cause I would have been like a 40 foot uphill putt okay. instead of the 20 feet I had. Yeah, and let let's uh, and now it looks like we've Johnny V's got it all queued up for us, so we can even watch it. Uh, and it's crazy because I didn't, I hadn't seen it from this angle, uh, actually. And you know, clearly a little bit right, but man, the fact that it just popped up and immediately started rolling on you is uh, yep. is crazy. Yeah, yeah, no, and that then, that green, you you wouldn't think that green's not super sloped, but it's sloped enough to where if you start rolling like that, yeah, that can definitely happen. And, um, and yeah, I just, you know, I got on the right angle and at the, at the wrong time and, and just rolled out. So let, let's back up just a little bit. I know that's obviously was a very pivotal moment, but the, the, what weren't pivotal moments were like the other seven times you threw out of bounds and then somehow saved par. What the hell was going through your head when all <laughs> these different times, including hole one, when you're starting off with the fireworks, but all these different times when you had thrown out of bounds and then you step up and somehow you save the par anyway. What, <laughs> it, how yeah, how is mean, that ta taxing you is, is maybe the best word. Yeah, I mean, it, it takes a lot. Every, you know, one of those putts just take a lot of mental energy to just, you know, you know you're already out of bounds and you basically par is the best score you can get now. And so that's, you know, it gets exhausting because you're not giving yourself a chance for a birdie, which – you know, that's our goal is to, you know, have a lot of chances at birdies. And if you're a good putter, you're going to capitalize on a lot of those and shoot good scores. And so it's not a sustainable strategy to, you know, you know, sometimes you realize a player, all right, I can throw the aggressive shot. And if I go out of bounds, I have confidence I'm going to make the putt. But it's not like a, you know, it almost seemed like that was a strategy. Like I throw it out of bounds and then make the putt. You know, like that's not what I was trying to do. That's what it's I just, you know, a couple shots got, you know, grip. It was raining. And so there's just lots of, you know, 
shots were a lot tougher because the conditions, you know, it wasn't, it didn't, maybe didn't have perfect grip or, you know, whatever the case may be. It's, it's, it's tricky in the rain. And then, and then when it stops raining, you almost get like clammy uh, fingers and it almost like you get like, you know, the pruny fingers that we've all had after it's done raining. So your grip turns a little different. And, and so even when it's done raining after it rains a lot and then stops, it's just, it, your grip isn't quite the same even when the rain is done. And so, um, yeah, just having a little bit of grip issues and, you know, luckily with the putter, I wasn't, I wasn't having grip issues with the putter and I was just, I knew that's how I had to score is by saving par because you can still score that way, especially conditions when it's raining is because pars are, are good when it's super torrential downpour, like it was the first, you know, three or four holes, it was raining pretty good. And so I just, I knew that pars were good when I, when it was raining. And I think that, you know, that kind of mentality helped me, you know, grind out those pars that I did in the beginning of the round that really allowed me to, um, you know, maintain the lead and uh, keep the pressure on Chris, who was the next, you know, me and him were basically battling for most of the round. And so I think that, um, you know, a couple times I, I gained, you know, I hit some nice par putts and actually gained strokes on Chris. Well, and that's that was maybe the follow-up is, do you feel like, I, I, clearly you're doing your best, but do you feel like that's aggravating to other players that you're kind of like low key pissing them off when it's like, <laughs> dude, this guy keeps throwing out of bounds and I'm not even picking up strokes on him. I mean, clearly that's not your, that wasn't your initial game plan. Isn't that their fault though? It's got to be frustrating. Like, yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's got to be frustrating though, right? When everybody thinks they're going to get a stroke on you and then you're, you know, banging along. Yeah. I for me, if I'm battling against somebody and somebody throws out of bounds, just naturally you're like, all right, I'm in bounds, they're out of bounds, so I should get a stroke. Um, and so <laughs> definitely, like mentally, yeah. you're like, it's very frustrating, especially the more and more it happens. Um, but that's all the stuff that we fight through mentally every day as players. You know, you're watching people bounce off trees, get lucky, and you know whether it's you know, you know, you earning the putt by making it or getting lucky. There's just so many variables that go on in your head, so. That's all stuff as a professional that you got to fight through. You know, if someone's throwing in shots from all over the place, well, this this is what you got to deal with, and that's what you got to do. If someone's shanking shots and bouncing off trees and going straight in the basket, well, that's that's the set of you know circumstances you got to fight through if you want to win this event. So there's always new things like that, new players that are playing good. There's always going to be somebody there, and so for me, that's what I know. Like, it's never going to be, you know, easy, and it's never you know almost never going to coast to a win. And I, you know, and as much as that's, you know, as a player, we're, we're in it to take the drama out, to dominate as a, you know, that we want to dominate the media. Yeah. Obviously you want close, close tournaments and people battling back and forth, long putts, you know, long drives and, you know, all that stuff. But as a player, our goal is to take the drama out. And that's the highest chance you have to win is because you, you allow yourself to have a bad break here and there and still, still win versus if you're battling and have a bad break down the stretch. Like that rollaway putt could have cost me the tournament, and so um, that's you know I guess the biggest thing is as a player is um, just the mental side is so different every tournament. And that's that's the beauty of being a professional is you never know what you're gonna get, and so and you know week in and week out it's it's the best players that handle that mental battle with themselves and the circumstances that are happening. Did all of that lead up to? Is all of that building? and comes out on 18 after the drive because I don't know if I've ever seen anyone on the fairway on a final hole react like that. Is this, is this one of the biggest reactions you've ever had on a drive? Yeah. Like I, I can't, I, I, cause I, I can't count even for world championships. I don't think I've ever seen anyone react like this. Yeah, no. I, so for me, it was, it was, um, yeah, it was definitely, uh, a, just all of my emotions came out because the, the way I look at it is, you know, obviously in the moment, you know, we, me and Chris were tied going into that hole. So it's basically nothing else matters. You know, it, this hole 18 is, you know, it's, it's a, you know, I think it's one of the hardest driving holes on the whole course and the whole tournament came down to it. And, and once he threw out of bounds, I basically knew that, Hey, my one goal is to throw inbounds. If I can throw inbounds, the tournament is over. It's no different than if I were to hit, if I were to hit a 30 or 40 footer, I would have had that same celebration. Cause I'm just excited that that's the moment that I was working for all week, you know, to practice in practice and all year that, you know, I'll give myself a chance to win. And this is, I'm capitalizing on it. That's amazing. And so, and, and, and for me on top of that, it was all the, you know, the roll away and the bad luck that I fought through and all this other stuff that was, you know, going on in my head 
to, that I would drop all that and just executed that shot, which is the biggest shot in the tournament, uh, to get the win. And so I, I got excited because like I, like I would if I hit a 40-footer for the win. The tournament was pretty much over at that point because, you know, with Chris going out of bounds, you know, on that hole situationally, if you go out of bounds on that hole, uh, as Nate knows, that, you know, you're basically 40, 50 feet off the tee and you're not getting up and down from there. And I was, you know, 250 feet away from the basket. You know, I could have got a three uh, if I, if I, you know, if I had to, but I was obviously just going to play for par. So once I threw that shot in bounds, the tournament was, was basically over. Uh, and so that's when I knew the moment that I won. And so that's so really some, the... Some people... The end. Yeah, and, and I, 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 clearly that makes all perfect sense. So as you're saying, some people may have been a little bit critical of you may maybe digging into the idea or or scratching the surface of feeling like that's a little pre-celebratory or and or that I'll go as far as saying maybe even unsportsmanlike and you're celebrating your moment and and all that excitement is all is all built up and is releasing and and I'm I'm guessing what the critics are saying is hey that also felt a little disrespectful to Chris. Is is that is that a fair assessment? Is that what you think people are then getting at? Maybe even even though that I'm, I'm guessing that's not your intention, but is that is that how people are perceiving it? I mean, even if it's accidental. Yeah, I mean, sure. With that with that ex- a, a emotion. Yeah. So um, could you understand yeah, I mean, that perspective if that's what the anger yeah, people can, have? That might be frustrating. Yeah, and I can see that. And I and I can you know I've I've been on the other side of that where I've been in, you know Chris beat me at Champions Cup you know, we were battling and you know that's how if you're at the top of your sport you're gonna win some you're gonna lose some and and yeah you know I may you know looking back at it maybe I I did go a little overboard but that was just I think so much built up that it's not you know that's not my reaction every time it's just you know with everything that happened the roll away the you know Chris coming back and just the momentum shift and so it all just built up. And I knew that shot was super important. And I think at the end of the day, once Chris threw out of bounds, and uh, he knew his tournament was over. And so it, not not at, until after I threw. So once he threw out of bounds and I threw inbounds, the tournament was over. And Chris's mm-hmm. head, it, you know, it's, it's, it's done. So me celebrating, you know, you know it's, it's no, really at the end of the day, it's no different than, like I said, making that 30-footer because – you're, nobody is getting you know up and down from where he threw. He literally was almost sure. essentially reteeing at that point because of the way the out of bounds was placed. And so uh, once he threw out and I threw inbounds, the tournament was over. You just basically had to go through the motions yeah. and and finish it out. Yeah. And so I think, as I say, it's really it's really interesting because we see that type of emotion on the green when someone hits a big putt for yeah. the win. You you've done right. it. I mean, Chris has done it. Uh, we see we, you know we've seen. Epic McBats at USDGC, those cheers. It it feels more natural when like the disc is done and you put it in. It was really yeah. different to see because you're right. That was your winning shot. Period. Like yeah. that's that is where the yeah. that's where the tournament quote unquote ended for almost everybody. And so th- yep. it, it, it sounds more natural when you say it like that, as opposed to, oh, this dude was celebrating on the 18th T in front of his competitor. Yeah. So but I I agree with you. I love the natural reaction. I love the excitement. Um, I again, I do understand what other people could take out of it. Yeah. I don't agree with it, but you know, that's it's, sure. it's, Look, it's, yeah. It's, now it's a feeling. And, and at the end and of the day, as fair, an athlete, prob- I'm never. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Terry. Uh, I was just gonna say again, another woulda, coulda, shoulda game. Chris puts it in bounds somewhere in bounds. You throw that exact same shot. You're in bounds. How do you feel like are you, are you that is still as pumped with that reaction? No, I mean, absolutely not. You know that not. that's I'm, what you need to continue. Yeah, right? yeah. The tournament's still go, like the tournament is still live. They're, like we still have to finish. Like sure. I would not even. It's not over at all. Like there's nothing. Like it would have been sure. totally different. I'll just walk down the fairway. There's nothing done about the tournament. It's not over. I'm close to over. We're both in bounds. Mm. But you know, I'm laying you know two in the middle of fairway. He's laying three, basically right off the tee pad, having to lay up again. To yeah. then go for the basket. Yeah. So, yeah, it just played out. This the, just the way it played out. You know, is why. You know, and as an athlete, you know, you know a hole and how holes play out. You know, you know. So that's you know, obviously, we know better than anybody. You know what we're trying to do, where we're trying to land, and how you know how holes are playing out. And at the end of the day, it's like as an athlete, I'm never like if if it was flipped around and Chris did that, I'm never mad at him. I'm always mad at myself. Never like it doesn't matter who it is. 
if I mess up a shot and you know I'm not gonna you know because I know people are like oh it's disrespectful to Chris but it's like Chris for in, in my opinion I think Chris is probably just mad about his shot not executing his shot he's not Certainly. gonna ever be mad at me yeah it's and like if it's flipped around I'm never gonna be mad at the person that did execute the shot it's just me it's all boils down to me I didn't do it or I did do it and I executed it and so that was my emotion you know and what what if yeah I'm not what, gonna, I'm what not if, gonna what if you were not how, what if you were I, not I last on the tee what if you were not last on the tee I mean what if what if Chris teed first through OB you were second you know and and you reacted that way and other people had to putt I mean or to okay. tee think about it on the green even if you make that 40 footer and say you're say everybody else is inside you yes you react you go get the disc out of the basket celebrate but other people still have to putt see other people's tournament are still on the line i mean think about even dickerson having to play hole 18 he was still fighting to maybe take solo second place and ricky by the way i want to say i don't have a problem with the emotion coming out i just wonder how you feel if you reacted that way if you were say second on the tee because the tournament's not just between you and chris for sure, yeah, no, and, and and you're totally right. It's it's something to where, yeah, I mean, uh, if if that if that was the case, you know, I feel like in the moment I would be respectful if someone had to mm. to still tee off or like you said, still putt. But you know, since I was the last one, I was kind of running down the fairway because we're gonna have to go down the fairway anyway, you know, mm -hmm. and so that's kind of why I started running because I knew I was the last one down and started obviously like fist pumping and yelling. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, there's. To be there's fair, that's not that much slower than you moved on the fairway anyway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. You're always, a, um, you're always out in the but, lead, there, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yes, you know, I, you know, m maybe I was a little over the top, and it's something to where you know it was just you know I guess I'm not used to being in that spot. Like you said, every, that it was such a you know unique way to finish uh, a tournament, you know, and the way it played out. Um, yeah, you're right. There, there's always other people playing, and you have to be respectful of of them. Um, but it's it's also, you know, for me, it's like, you know, you're always feeding off the crowd, and you know, the crowd, you know. So it's like, for me, I feel energy a lot, and I felt like, you know, the the crowd, you know, just really pumped me up and and wanted me to, I could, you know, I just felt the build up moment for that was 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 just when I wanted to erupt, really. You know, um, nobody nobody yeah. yells at James Conrad for running down the fairway after the holy shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, gosh. Right, right. Well, he had to get his yeah. disc out of the basket. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. He had 30 exactly. seconds. I mean, somebody right. was over there with a stopwatch on the side. Now, uh, uh, again, right. Rick, we understand, and, and it's fair to say, you know, this, of course everyone has their favorites, and and so if, if you're a f bigger fan of another player yeah. – it's probably easier yeah. to criticize you if you're 100%. when you're your biggest, you know, when your biggest fans are saying, yes, you're fully emotional and you should be, um, you know, right. it, it's all part of the game. That's why we're playing. You're not only and, playing to win, but you those are the moments that you live for. And, and I can understand okay. the, the, the raw emotion. You know, now had and, you turned around to Chris and given him the double, you know, the double, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, <laughs> that would yeah, have been a little I, different. <laughs> yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just really I love that Ricky did have that emotion, but you also you also realized it right away when you realized that you had run past Chris's disc. You made the immediate uh, correction, came to the side of the fairway, came back up. I mean, Ricky, I think you handled everything perfectly, and I yeah. think that you've I think that you've explained it in a perfect, absolute perfect way. It's impossible for emotion to not come out in that moment. And would you have done things different? Maybe, maybe, but look, yeah. I think you did the perfect thing. We're watching it right here. So yeah. I think you did a great job. And, yeah, so, no, I appreciate it. What, it, what does it, it mean? It, like said, if, if a player came up to me and said, Hey, like, you know, and I really like, if they expressed like, Hey, Matty O or Isaac, and that really like affected them, uh, then I would obviously like, Hey, like, all right, next time I won't do that. Like, if it really affected yeah. them, and the you know, like you said, because they still have to play out their tournament and finish the best they can, so I want to respect that. So I'm not, you know, I'm not doing it to be detrimental to them. So if I was, I will definitely, you know, reflect on that and try to be better next time if I get in that myself in that yeah. situation. And it's kind of funny because we all know yeah. Chris doesn't care yeah. about third place. Chris doesn't yeah. care about fourth place, no. second yeah. place. Nobody Chris does. cares about the win, which is yeah. why we saw him on his th third shot. 
like throw that crazy forehand that went out of bounds or whatever because he was running the yeah. basket and just got out of control. Mm -hmm. okay. And, and yeah. but you're right. If you know, if if somebody else were to do something like that, it's different for every particular player. Um, mm -hmm. Let's real quick talk about Ricky the the playoffs. Um, did the did the playoff scenario here the uh, the the DGBT playoffs does that matter to you particularly in this event does it does it mean anything because you're already up at the top the points kind of I, I hate to say it like you know whose line is anyway but the points don't matter you know we're here for you're here to win um did was that in He's your head at all taking Macbeth because of this weekend yeah so, correct so yeah uh, the same the question still stands. Um, so go ahead, but yeah, you overtook Macbeth. You got 125 points. He got 80, and now you're in front of him. You know that's a 45 point difference, and you're in ahead of him by 23 now. So go ahead and answer the question. You know with that. Yeah. Mind, so maybe. you know, yeah, I've, you know, obviously, the thing is, our events, and that's kind of like I heard you guys talking about the world thing. I think nowadays, our every event is so big, and they're pretty much the best players in the world are at every event. Mm -hmm. And it used to be like like what Nate and you guys were talking about, all the best players from from Europe and all the best players from whatever country that wa they wanted to represent their country and go to the world championships. Players do that now, but they do that at every event. They don't just do it at the Worlds. So every event is, is essentially like a world championship was, you know, five, five or ten years ago. And so the fact that every event is big, and, and, and all the best players are basically at the event. It basically is like a world championship caliber event, caliber event every weekend. And so, with that comes, you know, you wanting to to win obviously as a top player, but you also want to have good finishes at events to st play strategically and, and and win points titles and set yourself up for the Pro Tour Championship and finale. And so, I think it's you know. For me, it's there's a lot of pretty much every event is is really there's a lot that comes along with it because because you know how hard it is and you see the fields that are there and, and you see that there's so many people trying to trying to win and, and the the touring community is huge now and 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 so I think that at the you know what I'm trying to say is just every tournament is just so big and the best players are at every event and and so it's and you know and it's you know Nate used tennis I heard earlier. Um, tennis, you know, they, you know, they have a point system where they pick their basically four or five biggest majors, and then the world. Cha I think it's, you know, I don't know what they classify it as, but tour they don't champion. actually have like a world tour championship. Tour. Yeah, yeah, they do a cu accumulation of like points based on the four or five majors that they have, and then that, you know, whoever wins out of that basically is is the winner of the, you know, world cha championship or something. Is that how it goes, Nate? Something like that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is. And, and what I was trying to differentiate is that there's the difference between being the champion of a tournament and being the tour champion. And I think they're both very valid. I think, and I totally agree with what you're saying. Disc golf is inside the ropes as far as the play on the course. We're playing a lot of the same courses that we were just four or five years ago, but the players are better. Yeah. But, and, and, the depth of the field is incredible, but on the PGA tour, it is also like a masters every weekend. It is. And it's like a U.S. open every weekend, but it's that event and you become the champion of that event. So I'm trying to differentiate becoming the champion of the world championship and being the tour champion, which I think is a different skill in its own right, which is consistency over 20 events. Right. And has sure. there been a lot of weird Masters champions? Absolutely. Has there been a lot of Masters champions that are the best in the world? Absolutely. But has over the Tour Championship, only the best players get to play in that Tour Championship, unlike the World Championship, which is 200 players deep and is the biggest and most difficult test that we have in our sport? How, like, how you've had time to reflect on your comments from last week. Yeah. I mean, are you still dead set in what you said that day? I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah. So, so basically, you know, it's for me. It's it's um that's really the point that I was trying to make that I maybe didn't get my point across the best was was that titles. Uh, the difference between like I guess winning like a world championship and winning like let's say Waco or something 
you know, five, five years ago, there's a huge difference there. It's like, you know, it's, it's meant so much more to win a world's and a world's it obviously it means more than anything to win. And that's, you know, amazing. And that's the best pinnacle of our sport. But th what it feels like to win Waco versus Texas States nowadays is that there is probably just as strong of a field in Waco as there was at the world championships. So the gap there, as far as how you respect a winner from Waco uh, versus a world champion, isn't that much different. Like if you win on the elite series, you know, people respect you. You're a great player. No, and, and people just uh, know that because they, they know and respect you differently because they know how hard it is to win on tour. Like you said with the PGA Tour, every every event you know, has this, these huge, massive fields of the greatest golfers on the planet. And so I think that you know that is the biggest takeaway for me is just the titles nowadays are, are, are so much more equal as opposed to you know, you know, back in the day, I guess. Yeah, it's funny because yeah, I think I, part, I, part of the events and the names that we put on the events is the pressure. USDGC. Yes. Worlds, you know, the European Open, the Japan Open. These are the events, just the names now bring the pressure as opposed to what used to be the competition that brought the pressure. Um, and the fact that we don't play nine rounds anymore, which was different in Worlds and that that was another reason it was World Championships. You, It was a mar it was the marathon golf. It was the, it was the one that oh. showed not only do I have the stamina, but I've got the consistency. I've got all these stats against all these players we're in a different world now it's a five round event which really isn't that much different than a four round event um you know all the players now have have this have the strength and conditioning of a pro athlete for the most part we we now are looking at these events and and, and like i said it's the event itself that rotates and puts the pressure on um because you're right the fields you're getting the same top 20 players that you're again in every event Every event, you're probably, you know, give or take a week yeah. off for somebody, you're getting the same 20 players and that are going to push mm -hmm. you or whomever, or maybe, you know, can you're, I throw, you're, I want to throw ahead, out Nate. a, for instance, go for it. I Nate. Throw out yeah. a, just a, for instance, <laughs> I think I'm a three-time world champion gets to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh. <laughs> this, I, I just want to throw out a, for instance, Ricky. So in a couple yeah. of weeks, you're going to be in Rock Hill. Now you're going to play in the USDGC. This is a tournament you've never won before. And also, the Tour Championship is never an, a singular event that you've never won before. Now, you've been the points champion, of course, because of your consistency and great play. If, if you go on to win the USDGC, are you going to be thinking, okay, this is just my step to next weekend? Or are you going to say, wow, this is one of the greatest achievements of my entire career, an event that has eluded me my entire career? Or are you going to be thinking, wow, this is pretty cool, but that next weekend, that tour championship, that's the one I want. I just, I'm curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think, so for me, it's, you know, I, I reflect on a season based on how I played in each event. You know, obviously there's going to be events that feel bigger than others. But when you look back on a season, and, and I use this for an example, if I won every tournament but didn't win the Worlds, I'm, I had a great season. I'm, I'm, of course. Obviously, I'm yeah, more than pumped. You know? yeah. and, uh, and you could say that about if the person that won the World Championship, they're pumped too because they won, they won the tournament. You know? so, there's, so there's multiple different ways yeah. to have a great season and be, you know, put your name in the hat for being the best player in the world. You know, if you win every Elite Series – and someone else wins, you know, two or three majors, um, you know, it's who, you know, because the majors do, you know, they, they have more weight and they, you know, they have, you know, they have the, the name and they have the, the field strength. Um, but you also have to value the consistency of the biggest events that we have on our tour, the Elite Series also. And so I think that um, the value of, of certain tournament titles have gone up, I think, you know, the ledge stones, the you know, the um, Green Mountain Championships, the, you know, all in, you know, the Las Vegas Challenge, those events. Um, so for me, I look back and I'll say, you know, I had a, you know, I had a great season overall and I'm really happy with how I performed and how I played. And I felt like I, you know, I capitalized on a lot of opportunities that and chances I had to win. Um, for me, it's, you know, obviously GMC and, you know, Texas States and a couple of the other events that I've won. Uh, I look back and say, yes, I'm really happy with how I closed out that tournament, gave myself a chance to win and I won. And so that's, you know, I felt like I, 
was the best player in the world in, in 2022. That's the way I look at a season. And that's kind of, I think, um, wh- where my comment with the world championships comes is that, you know, if I win the world championships, I am the pump that I won the worlds, but that's just one step for being the best player in the, of the year. I just feel like for me as a player, I want to be the best player uh, as a whole season long. I don't want to be a best player of that one tournament. And of course, sometimes that means winning the worlds is one step in the right direction uh, of becoming the best player of the year. And, uh, and so that's kind of how I look at it. No, I love, uh, I love uh, that clarification. And I just think that that's, I think it's beautiful. I think it's beautiful to hear yeah. your perspective on it. Um, I could throw out a lot of more for instances, but I, I really appreciate so, you breaking that down. That so way. Ricky, well, yeah. real, as I'm looking there, at I say, Ricky, real quick question. How do we make the tour, in your opinion, the tour yeah. season, the championship, I don't want to just say the tour finale because that's just one event as well, but how do we, how do we promote the tour as, as a whole to be more prestigious? Because again, well, you've won what, five, four, four yeah. or five events on the tour? And and you're clearly having what is arguably the best season of the year for all players. You've you've dominated, you know, uh, for the most part, a lot of the these elite series or they're not elite series events. How do we make this more prestigious? Is that a player thing where you need to celebrate it more? Is that a media thing where we need to pump it up more? How do we convince the fans that hey, this is you know for some people bigger than worlds or as big or it's a big deal how do we push that out to the world well i think they are the pro tour is you know with 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 nate doing the commentary and the people watching you know he can offer the you know the insight and just his knowledge on the course and the history of the event all that stuff helps so much to paint the picture for the viewer and then and then they're like oh this tournament's been around and uh, for this long and it's just kind of builds that history and then the more you see that event also builds the builds the brand of the event. So, yeah, I mean, next, next year I may not win the GMC, but I helped grow the brand of the GMC. You know, I helped use my platform and my brand to grow the Pro Tours brand. So that's why I feel like, you know, I'm, and I'm beyond thankful that I can have a brand and have a following that helps grow the sport as a whole, too. It's obviously helping me, but it's also helping the sport pave the way for, for the person next year. That like, oh, yeah, the GMC, I remember Chris and Ricky got in a battle, and then maybe it's next year – Gannon and Anthony Barella, and they got in a battle, and so it just each year builds off of each other. And I think there's a, there's a the Pro Tour is doing a great job on, on building building that part because we're we're having consistent tour stops, great venues, and and, and tour stops that people want to watch. And I think that's super important. So I think they're doing it just naturally on its own. I think that's you know obviously a, a great way to do it. And uh, and so I think that you know I haven't spent too much thought on it but that's my first thought on it uh, let, let me follow up and say right now you, you have four and it's funny how this giving can come into play but you have four player of the years that have been awarded to you through the pdga which has a in this in essence and then you know similar but yet different set of criteria to arrive at that that at one point was very much more subjective where people were voting on it more so. But anyway, you have four of those right now. You have four elite series events this year that are already, you know, in your back pocket, including this last weekend. Does, does something like PDGA player of the year, are you thinking about that or is it, or is it exclusively disc golf pro tour champion? I mean, where do you put player of the year and, and by whose award? Because I guarantee you next week, some other website and some other rankings is going to come up and they're going to also make you player of the, you know, player of people that are six feet tall and, and their last name in a Y, I, whatever. DG like, rankings, rankings. Saying, we always, right. yeah, everybody's got a new rankings is my, is really my facetious yeah. point there. But uh, the short question is how much do you care about PDGA player of the year? Uh, I think so. I think you know, definitely, you know, it definitely means something. It's it's an award that you can look back on and say, "Hey, I was the player of the year in 2022." And I'm sure Nate thinks the same thing, and he's probably got you know multiple of those as well. You you can look back and you and within that year, you're like, "Oh yeah, this year I won." You know, Ricky won GMC, and and it kind of sets a precedence in history in the sport. Like, you're the best player of the year in in 2022, and so yeah, I want to win the points title. I want to win all these titles. And I know that each event that I win is a stepping stone in that direction to winning that stuff. And so that's why it means so much to me to, to, do, to do that. Because 
for me, that's really, um, as an athlete, you know, everyone's different. Some people are, you know, hey, I can just show up and win, you know, one or two tournaments and I've had a successful season. And, you know, you know, if you just pick, you know, and obviously I'm, I'm trying to win, you know, USDGC and the Worlds. Those are the, those are the events in our, in our sport right now, the European Open and the Champions Cup. Those, so the fact that we have those events that, you know, allow us players to feel like that extra added pressure because that title means more and, and, it, and it means more for points. It means maybe because the majors are work weighted more in point total for, you know, the standings and all the other stuff that come along with that. Um, so, so yeah, the, you know, the, the points is, is cool. I, you know, I, I, I'm sure there's a payout now where there maybe never used to be in the past, you know, obviously bonus money and just the, you know, the, the fact that you've, you know, you're consistent and, and nowadays that means a lot because there's so many players now that are playing at a high level that if you can, you know, you know, have salvage a top five finish, even when your game's maybe not at its best, that means something, you know, as a player. And, and so there's always something something to play for and, and and so i guess to answer your question you know the, the tour finale is, is also a great format i love it i'm i've i've you know in the past just not played very great very good uh, but i i think it's great that players like nathan queen kevin jones all these players they've they've made history and they've they've won the tour championship so it's it's the last event we have so that's kind of the last impression you can make on the disc golf world before you go into the next season so that adds that little bit extra pressure also and and it kind of feels like a major is is the the pro tour finale it kind of does it feels like i guess the dgpt's version of a major and uh and so i think that you know we're we're go we're stepping a lot you know in the right direction in, in a lot of ways and um and i think it's i think my biggest comment is that people i don't think the general public realize that um the how close like just regular events how close the fields are between a Deglo, a Ledgestone, the how close the fields are to the worlds, and that's really my point. Is that I think the general public perceive that like, hey, you know, the World Championships, yeah, it means the most, but the other events still are like right there with it as far as super the field strength. Yeah, super competitive. So I think that that is the biggest um, miscommunication that I was that I'm trying to get across to the to the fans is that every event is is tough no matter which way you you look at it you know and so yeah and that yeah that that's basically what i'm trying to say okay i like it um what what does it mean to you when we look at like the pdj stats right now you're a few dollars short of of 67,000 i think i saw whether it was 77 or 87,000 your previous you know career high what what do earnings money mean what does it mean now because you're clearly guaranteed a large contract that's obviously been pretty public a, a helicopter told me so but um <laughs> you're guaranteed this this significant contract but what does it mean when we're talking about a a 70 you know thousand dollar year or an 80 or a hundred thousand dollar year kind of put that in perspective for everybody i mean there's yeah, a lot of money so to still be one in the next like yeah. month i mean there's a lot of money on the line yeah no definitely i mean so it, it's not like you know that stuff's kind of like a result of you know of winning the tournament it's not like i'm oh i'm playing i have the chance to win twenty thousand dollars this week you know i don't i to be honest i really don't even look at the payout until after the event because it's not going to change like oh this tournament's only worth ten thousand I, I was hoping it was going to be you know fifteen thousand if i won like you know of course, yeah, I want it to be as, as good as possible, but each event, I'm, you know, it's you have the, you know, each course is different. There's so many different variables and so many things to focus on for that week that, you know, I'm not really focused on the payout. Um, and and for me, yeah, it's, and, and I know that I'm going to get paid if I if I play to the best of my ability and, and and everything is fully optimized. My play, my mental game, my health, and everything is optimized that week. I'm going to have give myself a chance to win, and that's week in and week out what I need to do to be my to be my best to be the best player in the world. And so all that stuff is a res, is just, just a result. It's not like I'm focusing too much on it. Um, I'm just playing week in and week out. You know, sometimes my game feels, you know, and that's just how you know sports are. You can, you know, your putt feels great one week and maybe it's just a little bit off the next week or your drive feels great. So you're always fighting these little battles with yourself and um 
And so that's why sometimes it clicks, sometimes it doesn't. So you're just trying to find a way to just feel your make your game feel great uh, consistently. And that's you know your game's oh, and that's the hardest part because your game's always evolving, always changing, new courses, all these different set of variables coming at you. And uh, and so I think that that's why for me being consistent, you know, and trying to be consistent at the top means so much to me as a whole in a season as opposed to, you know, maybe just one event. And um, and so, yeah, you know, that's, you know, that's my thought on that. Hmm. Okay. What do you say to, like, an event, you know, especially to, like, your fans, like Des Moines? I mean, that was so surprising to us. I mean, just to me, you know, being – your friend and longtime supporter, like what, what, what was that week for you in Des Moines? Yeah. So Des Moines was a tough week. I mean, it's, it, it was, uh, it was just one of those weeks where, you know, my, I felt like I was doing everything I normally do. My putt just felt that little bit off. You know, it's, it, my putting wasn't good. My, you know, my mental game really was, it was, that was the biggest thing. I kind of felt like I was looking forward, looking ahead to worlds before I was even done with this, the, the Des Moines challenge. And, um, uh, and, but at the end of the day, you know, it's a huge event. Like it was a really big event and it was awesome to see Simon and, and Robert, you know, at, you know, go at it head to head. That was so cool, um, to, to see that. And, and, you know, and I respect winners, you know, because I know what it takes to win. You obviously have that certain, have that respect for them because you know how hard it is. And so it was awesome to see Robert and Simon battle like they did, you know, head to head, uh, you know, that's what we live for as, you know, athletes, you know, we, we, we want to give ourselves that, give ourselves that chance to win and to see them, you know, making those long putts and pushing it to the next hole. It was, uh, you know, I basically just turned into a spectator cause I just, I didn't have what it takes that week. Uh, and you know, my tournament was over and it was just, it was like, uh, yeah, it was just, it was mostly mental for me. I was just kind of looking forward to worlds, you know, prematurely and forgot about the task at hand and, you know, missed the cut. And, you know, this yeah. day and age, if, if, if that happens, you know, it's, it, it can happen because there's so many players that are playing good that the cut lines are 10, 12 under sometimes by the time the weekend's over, which is, I think that's awesome because you have storylines in itself. Like, Hey, me or Paul or Eagle, they're battling to make the cut, you know? And, and so that, you know, that stuff can happen, you know, even in golf, it's kind of like turning into golf, you know, in Tiger Woods, when there's years that where he's the best player in the world, there's years where you also miss the cut because that's how yeah. that's how the yeah. game is, is that there's so many people that are playing at a high level that that makes the cut line just rise up. And, and that's what's happening in disc golf. Yeah, it's just it's been so rare, obviously, because someone like you who has you know, been such a dominant force, it, it becomes newsworthy, unfortunately. Uh, for you, it becomes newsworthy. You know, again, Paul at DDO yourself. Uh, and then real quick, I guess I'll, I'll take a quick tangent you're, you're you're good friends with Katrina. You're good friends with Paige. Um, do, do you make anything of of you know the 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 missed cut there by Cat and the near missed cut? I mean, w- without being disrespectful to Paige, she might as it was almost just the same as if she had missed the cut. She, she was on the cut. She line. she literally made the last yeah. putt. She she gets in. She then doesn't have you know a page like performance on the final day and shoot up twenty you know or ten spots like you know she's capable of. She just barely hovered around. So whether she made the cut or not, it almost feels negligible. I guess my question to you is: when you see someone like you know Cat and Page on the FPO side, very different world, but dominant players, the most dominant in the game for the last ten years. Um, you know, just a quick take on that since you know them both so well. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, and, and it's, it's kind of, it's very similar in FPO now. There's lots of n- new talent and players, you know, taking their games to the next level because there's kind of a shift in sports. Every, you know, there's, you know, if, if as a top player, you know, the, the, the next generation of players, you know, the Tom Brady's and, and the, you know, Aaron Rodgers, that's kind of like in a generation. And then you got the new generation of like, the Mahomes and the Justin Herberts, and they're kind of cycling into their prime. And so there's always that next shift of athletes. And as a top player, you have to keep up with the shift as, you know, whether in disc golf, maybe it's throwing 550 in, you know, 550 foot backhands and 450 foot sidearms making every, all your 30 footers, like just, you know, each sport has their own, you know, set of whatever, what it takes to become a top player or to be a top player. So, 
there's different shifts and there's, you know, shifts happening in, in MPO, shifts happening in, happening in FPO because the sport's getting bigger, more people are getting involved. So that's causing the shifts and it's shifting some people out and new people in. And, um, you know, obviously players like me and Paul and Eagle, we've, you know, kept up with that shift and there's going to continuously be a shift. And eventually, you know, obviously I'm going to take care of myself and try to play as long as I can, but eventually I'm going to get shifted out of the sport and there's going to be a new generation coming in. Um, but for, for as far as Paige and Cat, I think, you know, they're, you know, they're, they'll be fine. I think that, you know, it's, it's something to where it's, it's, it sounds worse than it is, but it's at the end of the day, because the field's gotten better and they may have played to that level a couple years ago and made the cut and, and, and maybe got 10th place or whatever. But now they play to that same level and they don't even make the cut or they barely make the cut. Now it's like way different because those players that don't normally beat them have now, have now elevated their game. So, you know, Paige, she plays to her, to her uh, floor and, and someone else plays just, you know, a little bit better than her. Then, you know, they end up beating her by a stroke or two and pushing her off the cut line. And so that's something, like you said, I, I like the variable and the, and the element of, of a cut line now because it, it adds more drama for one and it adds more storylines and, and it also adds something for the players to shoot for. If you're not shooting well, you have to really pay attention and, and grind. Even if you're not grinding to win, you got to grind to make the cut to get points or, or you know. And so it just kind of gives you that psychological mental battle with yourself to like, hey, I got to make this birdie on the next two holes to, to make the cut line. So I think that's a cool element that we got going in our sport, and I would like to see more of that going. And I think that, you know, as a player, I think players would also be all in for it because you feel accomplished when you make the cut. And you feel like, all right, cool, like I made it. I deserve, you know, to play the next day. It's not just like, you know, people, someone in 150th place is playing even though they got nothing to play for, you know. So I was going to say – Speaking of cuts. Yeah, I yeah. Are you going there? 70 okay. Go 72 ish people playing this weekend in MPO, one of the smaller fields, which also means because it's the playoffs, because it's, you know, rankings and and everything Not else, small enough. It's going to be one of the most one of the most competitive <laughs> fields we've ever seen. I mean, we always talk about how tough it is to cash and do well at Beaver State Fling because they, you know, have a, a limited amount in the ratings and so on. But uh, 70 some people 76 mpos and they're gonna cut 40 what down to 40 percent which is 28 ish 20 20 some 30 some whatever they're like there's some throats on the line this weekend i mean oh, three rounds at first. maple hill talk about like what that means you could you could go from winning to possibly just being outside of the cut this weekend if if you're not on right yeah. Oh, for sure. And, and, and that's, I love that. I think that, you know, w you know, whether, you know, I get cut or not, and obviously I'm going to be playing my best and, 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 and doing whatever I can to, to give myself another chance to win. Um, uh, I love it. I think it's, I think it's, it's great. It's a unique format. Um, it, and I know a lot of last week, there was some good players that missed the cut. And I think that, um, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it really is crazy. The shift that's going on with the amount of players that are playing at a high level. Um, and yeah, that's crazy that, 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 um, yeah, three rounds at Maple Hill and then, you know, 30, 30 players or whatever, 30 or 40 players are, are moving on to the final round. But, um, yeah, it just, it, I think that when you do stuff like that, it just makes you feel, you know, accomplished. And there's always, you know, obviously a storyline for who's winning the tournament, but then, you know, from a DGN standpoint, Hey, you know, if me or Paul or some of the big names are like, you know, in 40th place and we're, you know, having a putt on the last hole to make the cut to then, you know, that's a big storyline because, you know, if, if we make the cut, you know, we have the firepower to shoot back up the leaderboard and, and maybe gain a bunch of points to save our spot in the Pro Tour finale. And so that actually affects, you know, the next tournament if we if someone makes the semifinals. So that actually, that storyline is big because it affects future tournaments as well, like it does in when we go to Charlotte. If that person misses the cut versus if they make the cut and then now they go up another 10 or 20 spots and gain a bunch more points – like it adds that much more drama and it means that much more um, in the event and in the overall uh, pro tour finale point system. So I love it. I think it's going to be exciting for, for the players, but I also think it's going to be an exciting element for the viewers understanding how important points and stuff are for the finale. Okay, Ricky, I have a question yeah, for we're, you then. We're, yeah. Take it, 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 th th this on. is uh, put your, put your prognosticator hat on how many strokes between first place and the cut line? At MVP. 
That's a great question. So I know. Let's see here. <laughs> so it's only three rounds, right? Yeah, he should, do, you should do this for a living. You're so smart, John. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> three rounds. Yeah, three um, rounds. So three rounds after three rounds, the leader will be at um, 25 under probably. That's my guess. So I think after and then the, and then the cut line will be to Maple Hill's t- hardcore. So I think the cut line will probably be like seven or eight under. I think is what it'll be. Okay, so so basically about twelve to thirteen yeah. strokes. As I say, yeah, just just over ten. Yep, I, Rick. Yeah. So way, I think seven. The, the I think way, seven or eight under for the cut line. Twenty five under for the leader. And then we'll, uh, Ooh, we'll maybe maybe do a tweet or something, and we'll uh, we'll see how far I am off. What's your guess? I I was gonna well, say we'll ten have to under. Look into Nate so Sexton's that, crystal ball. Yeah, we yeah, we need Nate ah. Sexton's crystal ball. But I was I was gonna go right about ten under. I think ten under will probably be the cut. If you're below ten, you're probably not making the cut. If you're above ten, or better than ten, you're going to make the cut. That's my guess. I think, see, I clearly. think I think it's gonna be lower than you think though, because Maple Hill's a really t- is is a hard course. It's yeah. it's tough. I mean, you, you might guys have are getting so damn shoot. good. You guys are getting so good. I know. Yeah, <laughs> you are. We are. But. But I think Maple Hill is a lot harder than like it's a lot harder than Brewster. There's much more danger and much more punishment for bad shots, and um, and Maple Hill is hard to it's hard to you know it's hard to go ten twelve under for multiple rounds. You may do it one round shoot ten under and then follow it up with like a five or a six. It's it's hard to really shred and sh- you know like the leaders aren't don't normally get to forty under at, at Maple Hill through four rounds. You know you you know if you get to you know low thirties. High twenties. That's great. Yeah, most of the Rick, time. So the way the way that you played the GMC, from my perspective, was you you really took it to that course. I mean, you you played overstable plastic. You really were aggressive, and you were willing to go out of bounds because you were going to play that really aggressive shot. In your estimation, once you come to Maple Hill, do you play it still that aggressive sort of? over a stable line or do you play with a little more finesse at this course is there more late turns how how do you how do you make that quick adjustment coming from down from vermont yeah i know definitely i mean i think that you know out out at, in maple hill you know a fox run it's like you said you can play the over stable this and you know if you go out of bounds you don't you know you still have a par putt and and you can save a lot of parts like which i was what i was doing in the in the final round but Maple Hill, you're actually, if you're missing shots, you're almost worse than out of bounds because you're kicking into spots where, I mean, you're you're you, you, pars at best, you know, potentially very likely a bogey. Yeah. So, so sometimes you're worse off being in, in in Maple Hill if you get into some certain spots. You're worse worse off being safe in in a worse spot as opposed to being out of bounds and you get to take your drop and, and potentially just get an easy up and down for a par, you know. So. So Maple Hill can be more really punishing. So yeah, we're throwing. Uh, I'm throwing slower discs, you know, mid ranges off the tees on some of the holes if I can. Um, but you know, we're not making. I'm not making too many adjustments because you know you still have to attack the course and and throw the speed of disc to get to reach the shots. Even you know if it's a 450 foot shot and you want to throw a mid range, but you're not necessarily going to get a putt at it. You still have to take that risk. So there's times where I'm definitely going to still take risk, and we're you know know deep down that I'm going to be relying on my scramble game if and when I do get a kick eventually it's going to happen out there it's just not it's not if it's when and and just be, yeah. being ready for that I think that's the important part and that's something I'm working on a lot is perspective is uh it's it's a lot easier to to um to walk up to a 25 30 foot birdie putt and be all pumped and try and make that but you walk up to that 25 30 foot par putt after hitting early and bouncing into the into the crap you're like all you kind of pissed off, like oh, I can't, I'm putt for par, but like on courses like that, it's all about perspective and treating that that putt the same as you would a, a, a birdie putt. And so that's something I did really well last week at, at GMC. Is those par putts are just as important to keep your keeping your round going as a 25 foot birdie putt. And so that mindset is going to be what I want to carry over and hopefully uh, apply to Maple Hill. Yeah, that was super apparent because. Honestly, I really felt like the par putts you made, I mean, even that first round when you made that like 70 or 80 foot par putt on like seven, I think it was, yeah, and that really uh-huh. jump-started you. So I think what you're saying that you're actually doing, I think that perspective is really, really critical. 
For sure, and then, and like uh, you know, as a player, it's you know, if you you making par putts tw in scrambling and saving pars, is is a momentum saver. It saves your round. It keeps your round going. Keeps your round going. Obviously, with on the scorecard, but also mentally, because you didn't lose any strokes. You didn't give strokes away. So that just kind of, it just allows you to play a lot more, not with the mental roller coaster. Oh, bogey. Oh, no. but if you just get birdie a par. You know, par, birdie, birdie. It, the mental side is so much more flatlined, and it's so much more sustainable to shooting consistently. Um, and I think that's you know that's just super important is to be under control mentally. And I think that that's something I'm you know we're always working as as people as athletes, and I think that's something is trying to implement strategies to to optimize that. Uh holy cow! We're gonna cheers to this, uh, Rick. Uh, you you can't. We will. We'll do the work for you. You're, <laughs> You're you're, uh, you're doing work. I just rec I so I wanted to go look at. It. I was going to quiz you with how many times you've won at Maple Hill, but in my uh, incredible research department, uh, aided here by my beverage, right here. you you just won the largest paycheck. You tied for the largest paycheck ever for yourself with PDGA uh, earnings this last weekend. Did you know that? No, I did not. That's crazy. It was what was it? Twelve thousand, right? Yeah, yeah I know. so you won. Do you even sign the, the checks? World. No, you don't. You don't get checks anymore. They just go into your PayPal. <laughs> so, uh, no, they go right to uh, PayPal. Ari, right. Let, uh, and Ari's like, "No, damn it, Terry! I told him you only won nine. No, no, you <laughs> right. won twelve. You won twelve thousand dollars, which honestly I hadn't looked at before this. Twelve yeah, grand, no, that... tying your largest payout ever, which was your 2017 World Championships, your second Worlds, which was also 12 grand. So that is your largest check of your career. I will drink to that. Congrats. Thank you. That's what amazing. You that, that? I mean, the, I, I mean, it kind of goes back to what I was saying is that the payouts are obviously getting amazing. And I think that's, you know, that's because, you know, it's, it's awesome because I know, you know, players know how hard it is to win. And so you really get rewarded and it's, and it's, it's life changing. I mean, it's it gives you, you know, obviously brand presence. It gives you, you know, you 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 build followers and fans, and people feel like they're a part of something when you win, and obviously representing sponsors well, all that stuff. So, when people win, it's you know, at this day and age in our sport, if you win a tournament, it changes your life. You know, it can you know Isaac winning Idlewild, you know that's awesome. I love to see that. You know, he's he's a great player, dedicating his life. Maybe to you disc should golf. let them win more then. It's, <laughs> yeah, you're yeah, such right. A hog. Well, you're such a well, jerk. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't, I can't, I can't help that. I'm a little selfish. Can't help that. that. I I can't help that. Can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but you know, you know, if I'm looking back, you know, even during Idlewild, you know, if, if, when I turn into a spectator and I'm watching, it's like you're kind of always rooting for the person that, like, you know, is trying to trying to build their name up and get that next big contract and big paycheck like you said from the tournament it could change your life it allows them to to be more comfortable and buy a van or buy an art whatever it is to make themselves feel more comfortable and so that part's really cool as a spectator to realize that hey if isaac pulls off this win his life is going to be changed for the better and his, his career is really going to be kick-started and so you kind of it allows people to really root for them a little more and i think that's for you know for me once i turned into a spectator at worlds you know another reason why i was rooting for aaron is because yeah, it, it changes his life. He gets a, a great deal with this craft. He's a world champion. He gets all these new discs, all this accolades, all this, you know. And so all that stuff that comes along with the win. And so it makes the fans want to, you know, want to root for that person even more. Um, and so I think that, that that's just a sign of the growth of the sport. And it's it's awesome to see that. Well, uh, here we are, you know, just a, a few weeks left in the season as we start to wrap up here tonight, but a few weeks left in the season, big, big weeks, of course, you know, MVP this weekend, a couple weeks later, USDGC, a couple days after that, we start things off, uh, you know, where you're holding down currently the number one spot uh, for the Disc Golf Pro Tour Championships. Um, uh, how, do, how do you gear up? just to know you have these three out of the next four weeks or so, you know, are, are the largest paychecks and the biggest opportunities. How do you kind of mentally gear yourself up uh, to, to stick it through these next few weeks? Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, knowing that the season's almost over allows you to kind of exert yourself a little bit more because you know that mentally you got to give it all you got physically 
if you have any injuries, you just kind of got to forget about it. And obviously, you know, and just kind of fight through it because you know you can rest your your mind and and you can go on vacation or whatever after these after the season's over. So it allows you to kind of let loose and just really go all out with these events. And I think that that's something to where I like that. I think that you know you know having an off season is important to kind of reset your mind, reset physically. Um, and so knowing the off season coming is you know that's actually for me. I use it as like okay, cool. It's motivation. I want to. I want to go into the off season with like, oh, okay, cool. I had, I played great at USDGC. I did this and I did that. I want to look back on my season and be, you know, be, a, be proud of how I performed and how I played, you know, finishing the season. So I think that's motivation for me, is um, just knowing that I gave it my all mentally and physically um, going into the off season, and that's kind of where we're at in this season. Okay, uh, off season right now looks like. Uh, and I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but off season, uh, do you see that back in Arizona? D- and do you see doing anything really after the tour championships is done? I mean, is that is that now the new, end. you know, cut off the new end, so to speak, for you? Yeah, I think that's kind of you know it was always USDGC for the longest time. It was the USDGC, then the yep. tournament or the season was over. <laughs> but now they got the finals, the Pro Tour finals, and then I'm actually going to do the skins match. They have the hundred thousand dollar skins match at uh, eagles crossing in missouri um so yeah. that's yeah okay so that is one event that i will be playing uh which normally okay. i wouldn't um but obviously it's a big event i want to be a part of it so i'm going to play that the weekend after the pro tour finals and then and then my season's done and i'm going to jacksonville okay. florida is where i'm going to be going to train and practice and enjoy some good weather Okay. So you, are you going to move in with Paul? Is that yeah, I was going to say it feels like a weird <laughs> I know, right? uh, of of all cities, <laughs> of all cities right? and places, a lot of championships in that town. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, I know. We, yeah, so I'm looking at houses and and stuff, and yeah, I'm going to be uh, hanging out with Ron Russell too. Okay, he lives ah, there actually. Right. He texts me. He's like, oh, that's right. Yep. Yeah. He wants so to. He wants to put an aquarium texting. in your house. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Or a sick pool like he's yeah. got. I mean, but the real yeah, the real exactly. question is, and I need to know, where's Ari going to spend her off season? I mean, well, she'll she'll she, always she's be, what matters uh, the most. Kind of, yeah, exactly. Of course, she's uh, yeah, she'll be in Florida. Obviously, she'll be kind of back. She lives in Redding, California, so she'll be in Redding some of the time, and then Florida some of the times. I'm looking at buying a house, so and there's no state income tax in Florida, so that helps. <laughs> And uh, so yeah, I got buddy. that going, and and so she'll, so she'll kind of be going back and forth between the two states. Okay. All right, Rick. Well, uh, we're gonna start to uh, let you go here. Uh, is, okay. Is there anything else you want to? Sh- is there anything else you want to share with us that uh, you know any stone we left unturned or any other conversation? I mean, obviously we have you on often. Uh, you know, you win often, so it makes sense. But uh, is there, is there anything we've left out? No, I ju- I appreciate you guys asking great questions and and doing the research and and yeah, just doing everything you guys do for the show and and the fans. I I appreciate you allowing me to give my insight and you guys setting me up with good questions. I appreciate that. Well, Rick, there. You're, uh, I think tonight officially puts you into the record books for the guest that has most often joined us from a bed. Yes. And, uh, yeah. So I, I, <laughs> oh, you okay. have, oh, I think this has to be at least just... eight or nine. Ricky has the <laughs> best. Has to be... like, I, I'm not kidding. Like Ricky has the best relaxed shots off. Like you, you catch yeah. him the the infamous Utah Hand shot, strength, where, arm where, strength, just... where he's just like laying in the grass, and we catch that shot of you occasionally at other events when it's nice out. Just when there's a backup, you just tend to lay down. You we get it on the podcast. <laughs> Ricky's Ricky's at com- yeah. Ricky's comfy. <laughs> I love it. Oh, yeah. yeah. You got to take advantage of No one of has company, been you know? in more beds on our show than Ricky Wysocki, and uh, we wouldn't have oh. it any other way. Rick, as always, uh, go ahead, Nate, if you got well, something. I got to get sappy for just a moment because I don't get to see Ricky as much as I'd like to. Um, I just, I've just i known Ricky since he was just a little youngster, and it was there the day that uh, he took his very first cash at the Brent Hamrick Memorial. Yep. And, Ricky, what I'll say to you, is uh, you've become a great champion, as we always expected. But in my opinion, you've become an even better man. I love how you've really developed yourself and talking about all of these things, not just being a great player, but also being a great mental aspect, taking care of your body. I'm so proud of you. 
uh, Rick, and uh, I'm proud to be your friend, and I look forward to watching you play as many uh, times as I can on this side of the booth, because remember, generationally, you kicked my butt out, and uh, that's <laughs> why I'm over here. So <laughs> good luck with everything, dude. I'm really happy no. for you, Rick. I'm super proud of you. Buddy. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, always great to hear your expertise, and we're thankful to have you uh, explaining what's going through our heads as players, because you do a great job of that, and I'm thankful. Oh, thanks, Rick. I appreciate that. All yes. right, now, Rick, uh, as always, give us your, your final uh, praise, accolades, shout outs, how people can find you, support you, where they should be shopping, all that kind of stuff. Let's hear it all. Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, Saki bomb 13. That's my Instagram. Pretty, uh, pretty, uh, mm -hmm. post a lot on there. And, uh, yeah, just want to thank you guys. And I'm, you know, for everything you guys do Smashbox, And I love, uh, coming on here, chatting disc golf with you guys and, uh, sharing my time. So thank you for everything. All right. Well, you can also go out to dynamicdisc.com, sakibomb.com. There are you go, too. You can buy some stuff from, uh, from Rick and support him. And I know he's got a number of uh, signature discs and uh, tour fundraiser type discs. And it's always easy to uh, just pick something up from him in person. Him and Ari working the shop when they're out on the road. Those are all good ways to support uh, Rick there. Right, Woo! Rick? Woo! Yep, thanks for talking Ooh. for me, Terry. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah, you're welcome, Rick. I, you <laughs> know, sounds I'm better coming from you. Already proved, I am always <laughs> yeah. here to help you to help you out wherever I can, my friend. All right, Rick. Well, you enjoy uh, you enjoy the night time, and uh, I'm gonna go on have my, a good night. My bed. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> Take it to him, Rick. Uh, right. Kick some butt. Uh, this we're looking forward to seeing and hearing from Thank you this you. weekend. Best of luck. Congratulations on another GMC win. Uh, we appreciate you joining us tonight, and uh, we'll be seeing you this weekend, I'm sure of it. Take care, pal. Later, Thanks bro. a lot, guys. Talk to you soon. See you, Rick. See you.